product, decent raw living, heading for a Scottish prison, fuck your flawed system, I've risen above the law, listen, I've been to hell and back, smoking crack, selling smack, try to get my story straight so I can tell it back, became a man at eight, every night my ma was late, making sure my sister had a warm plate, but what thanks did I get, treated like I'm a regret, exiled from my family and friends. And so I'd go nuts The younger Scott they'd ever locked up So fuck they the understands the way I've grown up I've been through physical and sexual abuse Living with prostitutes peddling themselves for a boost My city's rife with AIDS People taking lives with blades Colder than the escapades And so we smoking nights away The drug and thug culture I'm stuck with bloodthirsty vultures And I wonder what I've done to get my lung punctured I wasn't born in this world, I was thrown into it by an alcoholic for a dad and a mum who just didn't know how to love. I was up against the odds right from the start. This is my your house, it's just not here anymore. The buildings are all knocked down. I can still see the place where my mum held my hand out slowly and burned it with a cigarette, just to teach me a lesson for playing with matches. I can still see the place where they took me into care. 36 different care homes in 8 years. I bet you they didn't even know why I never fitted in. I want to tell you a story, but in order for me to tell you this story, I'm going to have to delve into the demons of my past to find some answers. And some of them are only going to be pretty. I was taken into the care system as a vulnerable eight-year-old. I was released back onto the streets, a multitasking criminal, at 16 years old. Probably at the most critical age of my life. Left to my own devices. My area is completely destroyed. Through AIDS, through drugs, through nobody just getting a fuck. They've let a full generation of people died in here and just be forgotten. Just forgotten. It's hard to believe next to New York, Edinburgh was the biggest city of AIDS. And now it's like it never even happened. I've lost so many pals, friends, family, my peers. It's hard walking along here looking at the photographs. My distant memories. This just looks like a bit of barren waste ground to all use. But for me, this was my childhood. Edinburgh has not learned to live with its ignominious title of AIDS capital of Europe. The widespread use of drugs in some areas of the city has led to an explosive spread of the infection. The sharing of needles to inject heroin and the consequent passing on of infected blood is the main way in which the virus can be spread. The issuing of clean needles to addicts may be controversial, but the report's author says the AIDS problem is a more serious one than drug abuse. To get a better understanding of my community and what addiction and drugs and poverty has done, there's only one man I know who's really got a unique insight into it. Steph. He's my own drug worker who helped me come off the methadone. When I was first here in 84, th that was the explosion, that, that was the, the kind of HIV explosion then. Roy Robertson did his paper, uh, which he published in 85, I think it was. So Roy from Muris Medical Group. And he looked at blood assays that he had refrigerated for his drug using patients. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it was 167 patients. 51% um, of those patients were found to be HIV positive. And this added to sort of the burgeoning global realisation that there was a connection between injecting drug use and HIV. Um, similar studies were done in Glasgow, England and Wales. In Glasgow, 5%, 4.5% of the patients in Glasgow were found to be HIV positive. In England and Wales, it fluctuated between 5 and 10%. So Muirhouse, 51%. The rest of the country, somewhere between 5 and 10%. And I think that's why Edinburgh was tagged the AIDS capital of Europe in the mid-80s, and Muirhouse was probably the hub of that capital.
My life's changed so much. I never ever thought I'd be a family man. I remember in the dark days when I used to sit and think to myself that I would need to be coming my funeral. That just doesn't even seem like me anymore. Looking at my kids makes me realise how lucky I am. Go and put your jumper on, Gary G. It's on the door. They, you, you've not changed your socks, so get them changed. That's what they do, something. What did they do? Daddy. <laughs> <laughs> Looking at my kids, I tried to think what they would do with it, me. After all these years that I took drugs, I think it's about time that I went and got myself checked for AIDS and the Hep C. So that's me just been for a AIDS test and a Hep B booster. That's where the needle went in for the HIV. It's funny, an ex-junkie. I'm not even an ex-junkie. The doctor doesn't think that, that I'm, a, I'm an addict because I'm on 5-dihydrocodine. And if I wanted to there, I could have went and got methadone because I'm in such a low mood, he says. If I want to go and get methadone, I can go back on my methadone programme anytime I want, which I just think is fucking appalling. I'm sitting in that fucking surgery, and as I'm sitting in that surgery, I'm looking around me, thinking how many people have been here before me, the story that I'm trying to tell, how many of them, I'm running out of numbers now. I've run out of numbers for the amount of pals that I know that have died. Tam's had the virus for 21 years. When he first got told he had the virus, he was told he was handed a death sentence. Everything I know about living with somebody with AIDS is comfy, Tam. But Tam's beat the virus. I think the combination of therapy of drugs have helped that. Aye, we five years. Jai's 21 now. Thomas must be 33. Aye. Sarah, 28. 28 and pregnant, I've got to be a I'm grander. Learning. Oh! Just, grander just think before the combination come out, I just used to live day to day. I didn't even used to bother if I'd die in the morning. I used to fall asleep and say, well, if I fall asleep and die, I'm not bothered. Did you get to a point where you were like, fuck it with, like, with the virus? Like, I'm not even asking that. Well, that was before the combination come out. It was, it was in the 80s and there was people catching the virus, like in Leith and stuff like that. But uh, if it, it was a thing like, if you if you had the virus, you're a fucking alien. You know what I mean? Nobody would come near you, sort of thing. But I'm just the sort of guy that would say, I want the virus. I would. You know what I mean? And if anybody said anything, it would be, it's always behind your back. Aye, never your face. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it didn't <laughs> matter to me. Remember when that guy says, remember when he says to you, can you give me some of your blood so I can get on DLA? Aye, uh -huh, yeah. unbelievable. The guy wanted to uh, inject your blood so he can get the virus, so he could get more brew money. Aye, uh, so he could get the high rate. I was like, you've got to be fucking kidding. I remember you told me that, I was like... I see you, I see you. You just come in the house. Nuts. Fucking unbelievable, man, that's mad. The best yeah. one was when you went down to my house. And I had all the valleys and all that. And I put them all in the, <laughs> the toilet and flushed them. <laughs> you were fucking fucking. I was like, how can you do that? Like, you could have just gave them to me. It's a waste. I just seen them going down the sink and I'm like, you can't do that. It's like throwing an ounce of kit into the fucking water. It's like, I'd much rather burn that away, but. Done you a favour? You did do me a favour. <laughs>
I'll tell you something now that you might not know, right? It's kind of a sense that I flushed the smack in the toilet. I never. I took it up to the house with Brian, right? What's you me now, then? <laughs> <laughs> you just stuck yourself in your window. <laughs> You're still not learning. <laughs> To continue with my future, I've got to face up to the demons of my past. One of these demons is something I did to Tam's mum. I want to apologise to her. So how are we going to get in the stair? Press the buzzer. No, press. Press the ball. Are you beginning lying gouging, Gary? Not for a long time. Not for a long time, yeah. What my ma's been through. Aye. Aye. See, through, through <laughs> hell and back, we are family like we've got. We had Derek Hughes in that passed away. Trisha, his wife, passed away. Brian did now and again. Yeah, no, often not. Not very often. Unless you make Wally it. did, <laughs> but not very often. He got Hep C, but he managed to get rid of it. Uh, aye. Because he's insurance in the car and all that stuff. So. And I was the worst. You can like the Christmases and everything that you gave me. Can like when I first came to care and we always remember the laughs we used to have at Christmas. Yeah. I'd never heard that before because we're in, yeah. in the children's homes. You never seen yeah, any of that. could come in my house at Christmas. New Year, anytime they wanted. I need to apologise for something. I'd, like, hey, let me get this right. I want to apologise for something that I'd done in the nineties, which was bring heroin back into your house. And of, I should have learned after time and that that heroin just fucking destroys families. And I never, and I want to apologise to you for that. And just just that in itself. There's probably a million and one other things I have to go to apologise for, but. We've got me sat. We've got me sat, Gary. But that's just <laughs> the one, because like, if you've never done what you've done, like when I was 16 and my nana had obviously died, I wouldn't be here. But, I mean, your, your wife was the same, Gary. She never gave you much. If she was on it and you were on it, what? No chance. You have no chance in hell or you're coming off. No. Because you try to come off and she's taking it and you, ah, just have, I've gone, just oh, a wee bit, not. Gary. And that's what I said to you then, but you, you wouldn't listen to me you, then. You couldn't, I didn't think I could listen at all. You said to me, no, no, I'm coming to ban you. As soon as I looked at your face. That's what, looking I looking back on it now, thinking about how me and Angie would walk in here. That's right. And go. Oh. Like that, but now I feel like, how, how could you do that, Gary? Can like, but at the time, at the time, it was, uh, that's what it was done. Yeah, it didn't seem like I was doing anything wrong. Can like, then you say, Oh, she's coming off, she's coming off, it's Gary, she's not coming off. Have a good look at her, so that's right, eh? But you can you look at her because you were seeing the same as what you were doing. I wanted to pay my respects. I had a leaf flowers at the grave of Tam's brother, Tam's sister-in-law. I don't know what to say in the names, but I know a lot of million people are buried here. And it's horrible, looking around, seeing name after name after name after name that I know. There isn't even enough flowers to go around. And I feel so fucking sad for that. When I have a feeling like this, my first thought is heroin. There's no other thought. First thing I think about smack, that tin foil, the taste. The money, I fucking miss it. I miss it a lot. I miss the smart days a lot, but it sounds fucking weird. But I'll tell you what, when I was on smack, I never ever felt any of this pain, and my hands never shook. My hands did never shake on smack, and I didn't ever have a conscience. 
No, I'd have had a guilty conscience on smack. Now I feel like I'm fucking guilty for everything. Now I feel like I apologise at every given opportunity. I almost feel like cunts like me didn't deserve to be here. Rule number one, get yourself a gun. Rule number two, stay low to your crew. Rule number three, this is special to me. We smoke that weed and set my mind free. Rule number four, always make sure there's no burns on that house before you go through that door. Rule number five, on a fucked up street, stay more than survive. Rule number six, always make sure the DS are out your mix. Rule number seven, take a toke of your joint for the boys up in heaven. Rule number eight, always double up when you're doing your last eighth. And rule number nine, if that bird is fine, touch her softly, compliment her mind, trust me, you'll tap that in time. And rule number ten, always stack more than you're spent. And if you're reincarnated, come back and do this all again. Surgery. Can I help you? Hi, I wonder if you could tell me, please. Yeah, I had a, um, a, an appointment with Dr. Evil David. Uh -huh. um, and the purpose of the um, the appointment was for a HIV test. Okay, I'll get a message to your doctor first thing in the morning and he'll give you a ring. Okay, that's brilliant. Thank you. No problem. Cheers. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Filmmaking has managed to overcome barriers that I never ever thought would be possible. Connor, Thomas, Andy, you've got your characters. You just know what your characters are. When you're somebody like me, your past either works for you or your past works against you. We wide or media, my past works for me. I know these guys are at a critical age. I was at that age once as well. That's why I started Wigdom Media. I'm so proud of them. Seeing them come here every week and doing what they do. Doing something creative instead of getting into trouble on the street. That makes my life very, very special. It's up to you what you bring from here on in. This is the foundations for the film. Just think about your characters first. When Saturday comes, you have got to be in amongst it. Do you know what I mean? There's got to be people outside watching and stuff like that, but if you're in character, you're starting to feel. Do you know what I mean? I want you to feel like the character's emotions. This is the last time. Go! That's brilliant! That's fucking amazing. Compared to last week, that's why I just want to end it on a fucking high like that. Look at the difference from last week to now. We bring the fucking back in. 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 Action. Go for it. Set me to that. Fucking baby. Cut. Sometimes when you stand on council estate, it's like standing on McVilla. There's that many different cameras. You don't know who's looking at who. Is it any surprise we all cover our faces? I'm shocked that other people find it shocking that we live like this.
What do you think other cunts think of us? Ned. Ned. Well, I guarantee Ned. Ned right. is what <laughs> first time it pops into any country. I don't care who it is. Ned. See if somebody calls you a Ned, what would you do? It all depends who it is. But if it was like some cunt just being like, yeah, you're a Ned, it'd be like, what? Do you feel that offensive? Aye. How many times have you seen people walk down a street and see people like us, and then they turn back around again and walk away? Oh, absolutely. Uh, loads of people. Aye. One thing everybody in this room hates, but junkies. Junkies. The junkies. One thing that everybody in this room hates is junkies. The one thing that controls North Edinburgh is drugs. You know what that's, you know what that's called? A paradox. Because what's ruling these streets, if you're a doubt? Oh, they're standing about in that. Junkies. Aye, this junkies. Well, Centre junkies. Centre junkies. What's Greasy, a sleazy George and that. So, like, what, what death defies a junkie? Because I know I take valleys. I've got a smack head. 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 It's heavy on it. On the hard shit. Somebody's just doing that all the time. Aye. But who aren't they even bothered about? Aye. That's what annoys me. Me, they'll walk about the streets with their beards and everything. Ah, <laughs> pure mongo fight. That's pure dirty. The bairn doesn't deserve any of that shit. Just like what happened to us when we were growing up. Mm -hmm. But nobody used to think to themselves back then, days, oh, that's brutal on that bairn. I understand that. Bairns are it's brutal when you see a bairn walking over with a junkie, especially bairns that are already old enough to be embarrassed about it. From the age of six or seven, my life's been fully recorded. It's funny that. No wonder I'm a product of the system. Hello, this is Jennifer Bryson at Birthlink. I'm looking for Gary Fraser. Gary, um, it's about the files that you want access to. I've been allocated to share that information. And they're ready for you to get whenever you want. Uh, OK, thank you, bye. Fuck it, whatever doesn't kill you makes you stronger, eh? I've read through and I was getting a real sense <laughs> of you being a real character. <laughs> and some of the things you got up to, I was like, ooh, want what, to meet what, this guy. What was it, what was it, what was it, what was it? Well, you were forever running away, so obviously the system wasn't doing it for you. Um, I've, I've got um, Howden Hall, Rossi, Midfield, St Joseph's, um, I've got Foster Placement, Kenmuir St Mary's, Woodland School, Newton Stewart. But remember, I reckon there's about 1,500 pages because I've got 287 here. But the one I noticed there was that he'd stolen a boat. <laughs> Gary has been arrested, a charge with theft of a boat and will probably be held in police custody for the rest of the weekend. Yeah, so there was, there's loads of, you know, phone, loads of, these are emergency uh, social work uh, reports. So these are, you know, um, contacted by A&E Royal Infirmary. Gary made his own way reporting he'd taken too many jellies. <laughs> I never drunk alcohol, mm -hmm. that's right. As you can see, I wasn't one of the type of teenagers that went away and drunk. No, no, that. right enough. Do you know, there's never, when I went through this, there was never any mention of alcohol. I think I was too scared that I was going to end up like my dad, so I stayed away from the drink altogether. Right, yeah. I think, see, because it was being streetwide, mm -hmm. I was always scared that, see, if I was drunk, mm -hmm. that's when I was going to end up getting, like, something would happen to you. That's when aye. I Somebody I would something. take advantage of you. Absolutely. Sexually, aye. The hardest thing, about being an ex or about the care system. Is it the members of staff that are the best are the mm -hmm. ones that are most likely to lose their jobs? <laughs> yeah. Most people have got um, photographs for their childhood, I see them got care files. Mm -hmm. Seems to be a recurrent theme in Gary's life, eh, that everybody just takes me in. 
family statement left, right and centre. Always in the search for a family or people to take me in and love me. Can't believe that I'm driving past the same houses that I used to stay in when I was a bear, on the run. Walking up to my first ever children's song was probably one of the hardest decisions I've ever made. As I'm walking up the pathway, it just feels so different coming up here as a man. I had some good times in there. There was laughs, we got to go bowling, you got clothing grants. But by that time, the damage had already been done. My first placement was foster parents. After they took me out of Muir House, they put me in a young person's unit in Balerno. Within the first week, I was sexually abused. And this guy, a 14-year-old guy, walked into my room and told me that if I didn't and put his penis in my mouth and suck it like a lollipop, he was going to batter me. And I couldn't tell anybody to me who's about that. I couldn't tell anybody about that apart from a member of staff. How can I tell anybody about that? Everybody will just think I'm a poof or they'll just let it happen. Ha ha ha, Gary. Ha ha ha, Gary. And within about three months of that happening, I was in self-destruct mode until I left care. And not once did anybody ask me if I was ever abused when I was in children's homes. Is it any wonder I had a deep distrust for adults for 10 years old onwards? This is me going back to visit a woman who tried to foster me when I was in Sycamore. It's funny because the first time she met me, basically what had happened is her daughter Trace is a year younger than me and she snuck me into her home. And when she snuck me into her home, she hid me in the linen cupboard. So at six o'clock in the morning, her mum's getting ready for work and she puts her hand in the linen cupboard and what does she find? A wee 11 year old laddie lying in the fucking linen cupboard. Is your name Rosanne? Aye. Oh, you don't remember me, you know? No. Remember I was in the children's home? Gary, I was the wee laddie that you found in the... Cupboard. Uh-huh. Well, you're not the window cleaner. You're taking the pads. No, I'm not the window cleaner. I only came through to see you, just to thank you. All right, are you Gary Fraser? Oh, shit, we're done. Anyway, I'm glad you're all right, son. I think everybody, <coughs> this was the place I wanted to come, came out when I was younger. So I think like what I wanted to do in the mess when I came through here was like thank you for showing me affection and showing me like what a family is like because oh, I came out of the homes like I'm not or I thought like the way I came out of the homes was like Well when when you when you come here you were calm and you you loved it but then the, the drugs you away from here and you just went That's what the problem is, they took me away from right, somewhere that was took all right. You away that was all right and then the you fought against again. them and done something wrong again, eh? Aye, ah, it's like, they didn't listen. Like, this would have been a, I think this place would have been perfect. I think your family, I think everything would have been perfect. There wasn't any reason for them to be the way they were, but I just didn't think they listened that much. So why did you never come back after you reached a certain age? Once I started taking drugs, I started dealing them heavy. I started going down to London, hooked up with the Turkish Mafia down London. Oh my God. And then came back up here, uh, started dealing loads of heroin. And then that's when I started hearing stories about Fife that Sinky was on this and so and so was on this. And I'd never experienced any of that through that. And I wanted to come through in the big flash BM and, and I thought, that's no meal. I didn't want to come back through to Kirkcaldy like, oh, look, look, look at me, I'm the big man. I wanted right, to come eh? back through. I didn't ever. Did they forget your roots? No, nah, no, nah, yeah. that's why I'm sort of back through here today. Eh? Oh, Gary. Mm -hmm. Oh, Good place, isn't it? What a shame. It's not a shame because it's the rain's turned out for on you. I know it would. I think we're just stuck on Gary. We must just be stuck on your mood. As I left Roseanne, she gave me a letter. A letter she must have kept back after all these years. This is what it read. Dear Roseanne, hi. How's things? Are you still in hospital? I had to cry myself to sleep last night. 
I will probably have to do the same tonight. That's how depressing it is. And I'm being God's honest or truthful. I've cried every night and day since I've got back. I got told I'm not allowed to phone you or nothing. I swear to God I'm going to go mad in this shithole. Sorry I never got you a get well soon card. Well, if you are still in hospital you will be alright. Well, got to go. Love from Gary. P.S. I miss you very much and I love you. And I will give you a tear. I went to the doctors last week. Aye, last week. And I was trying to tell them that I was struggling with the prescription that I'm on. I was saying to them that I was having a problem when it came to maybe using again because I'm making a film which has got a lot of emotional shit in it, blah, 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 etc. And the doctor's response to it was that they can get me back to CDPS by Monday, which would have been last Monday. So my plan is that I'm going to come off of these. That's the plan. So the time that you watch this film, I'll be drug free. The time that I speak to the doctor, I'll be drug free, so it means they've got fuck all me. But this is the bottom end of the drug addiction. This is the... This is the... Grassroots of drug addiction. This is how they handle you. One for anxiety. Pain colours when I'm not in pain, but they've got opiates in them, so it numbs emotional pain. The only bastard about taking drugs that numb emotional pain is when you come off it's like that pain's tenfolded, and you'll probably see that soon as well when I come off, when you see me lying in the bed. The government in this country is spending 28 million a year on methadone to deal with heroin addicts. That's what I call a successful dealer. But I think it's a waste of money. It's a fucking disgrace. Methadone just keeps people like me trapped into their system. I never thought I'd end up growing up and turning into a junkie. I didn't think that would have happened to me, not on my path. At 16 years old, when I came out of the security units, I was so fit that I was advised to join the Marines or the Army. But then I took my first drug, the hydrocodone, DS, and my career in the drug world took off from there. This is fucking weird, like, coming back up here. This is where I got my first flat after being in the Young Offenders. <sighs> Done a lot of damage up here, like. This is probably where my life changed. I used to be under surveillance for two of these top flats for the West End Busies when I used to deal my smack up here. I used to control all the heroin at one, two, three, four, four streets, five, five streets. I made so much money. I'm gonna try and go on my old stair and see what the fuck happens. I'll show you what I've done at the back doors and this is why I've never ever got healthy sentences up here. See the look? on the door. All these back greens have got certain looks on them that I took off 
so when I ran out, when I got chased off the pole, or I knew that the poles were coming, or I knew somebody was coming to my door, or I'd just say that I was going to go to stealing, because a lot of the shit that we'd done was at night time. So it's quite hard when you're, this is quite dark at night, and all these back grains are really dark. So what I'd done was went out with a screwdriver and took the lock off of this door, and I put eight other doors in the back grains, so I could run out from here into this back square, and then choose about three doors, go into one of them, be out another street, and the police are always chasing their tail. Even while well, I had a habit now, I was still trying to do stuff like go to college or try and do something with myself, no, be a waster, basically. And then on Easter break for college, I took a bag of smack. I was all sick all about the place. I think we all thought by burning heroin it was different. It was a different feeling by burning hair on what was to inject in, and you couldn't get a habit if you burnt it. And in the constant transport, and they were for the 80s, they were all daft days, we weren't different. It's a lot cooler when you've got a bit of foil in your hand. Obviously, it wasn't, but it still seemed like that at the time. It just seemed like it was a fashionable thing to do. And every cunt was doing it. And I mean, like, fucking pure random. I used to come out, and every cunt was sitting all here, like, literally open my window, like, who's wanting? And you used to have, like, four here, four in there, because I wasn't letting cunts up to the house. I became more violent. What I'd done was just rattled this cunt's knee about, I don't know, about 20 times, 30 times with a ballpoint hammer. I remember the guy trying to stand up. I mean, he stood up, his leg folded backwards, so it went like in on itself. I mean, only like, <clears throat> so if we were like that, you can just imagine what the fucking guy's scream was like. And that just made me feel even more fucking invincible that I was just going to keep managing to do what I was doing. And, there wasn't going to be any consequences for my actions. The last time that I was here, the last time that I was here was probably what you would call rock bottom. I think you missed alkies or missed junkies in that say. We hit rock bottom first and I hit rock bottom with a crack. In hindsight, looking back on it, I'd pretty much say the reason that I never got caught is because the West End police were probably building up a big, massive case on me. So if I'd kept on the path that I was gone, the buses would have got me, but because I fucked up with the crack, I just started taking the crack, and then before I knew it, I was spending like a grand a day on crack. The person that I was when I was here just doesn't inside me anymore. I do kind of believe in God or that or not, but I know that if there is such a thing as God and there is a heaven or a hell, for the shit that I've done in this year, definitely I'm going to hell. It's like you bring a doorbell and it's fucking stuck. You can just imagine like a wee immigrant or something out there. Hi Gary. Hiya. Uh, the results are here but I can't really read them. Um, if, do you want to follow me back about... Uh, 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 half past eleven, and uh, you can speak to one of the doctors, and he'll go through it with you. Ah, that'd be brilliant. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very okay, much. Bye. Cheers. Bye. Daddy. 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 Listen, Disney, you have to go sleepy now. Want some milk? Want some milk? Mummy, put it there. Listen, no. You go sleepy now. 
Mommy, put it there. <laughs> See, no, no, it's no, no, it's destiny. Shock. Jesus. Hmm. Do you remember this when Gary J was lying in his cot? When did you first know that you'd fallen fall in love with me? First heard about you and the Rai. You were the one that tortured people. <laughs> you were the one that put somebody's head through a wall. I think the first time that I knew that we were in love was when I first took that pregnancy test. And uh, sadly, obviously, we miscarried. I just remember lying up at my dad's for that long, just cuddling in here. You made me feel so safe and just so... It was hard for the both of us, but obviously everybody felt sorry for me and I felt sorry for you because nobody seemed to think it affected you. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. What was it like to see me getting stabbed? I tell you what, that was one of the most scariest moments of my life. And I did always say to you when I first met you that I'm going to see you getting stabbed your own blade and it happened and I knew it was going to happen one day. And I remember going up the lift to the Knox Gangs and being absolutely petrified because all I seen is blood everywhere. When I first met my wife Angela, I didn't think I'd ever seen something so beautiful in my whole life. I proposed to her within the first week after taking her out on a date. Angela was definitely my first love. Without a doubt, the turning point for me was when Gary J, our first son, was born. I think that once I'd cut that cord, I knew even something back then had to change. Get this bit. <laughs> we have three lovely kids, and I love them all dearly. I know our lives would be much better off if I could come off the drugs and beat my addiction. I just wish there was a magic way out. But a new life, you come here. it doesn't work like that. This isn't a fucking fairy tale. I haven't taken any drugs. I want to come off. But withdrawing is hard as fuck. <laughs> and it's hitting me really hard. This is my second night rattling. Two days without fuck all. And I feel pure shit. This is second night rattling. Two days without fuck all. I feel fucking shit. My nose is running. The idea is just coming at me, I can't even film it. I haven't even got to get anybody to film it because it's just fucking, it's too hard. I keep having panic attacks, like left, right and centre, I'm having panic attacks. Oh. I just think to myself, why the fuck have I chose to do this in the middle of a film? Especially my first fucking film, why did I choose to try and do this in the middle of my, why did I try and choose to do this in the middle of my first film? Every time before, like, I've rattled in the jail. Oh, rattled somewhere else. Like, rattling just means withdrawn. Every time I've done it, I've done it. I don't know, maybe I've done a fucking wrong thing. Especially try to do it like this. Like, I want my film to be good. I want my film to show people certain things. I want my story to show people certain things. And I can't do it if you're having fucking panic attacks in the morning. I'm supposed to be working or doing something. I'm supposed to be doing something to do with the fun, to do with the story. I want to shoot this video diary, I really do want to shoot this video diary. I want to just show people what it's like to come off opiates just on camera. I don't think I'm going to manage to do it. I really don't think I'm going to manage to do it. This is, well, I hate doing this shit, like, my yeah. wallet, whatever, but I think, if you've noticed one thing by now, that I don't care what I'm talking about, I'm not talking about wallet, just cut, I don't care what I'm doing.
I feel ashamed for taking the smack. I feel dirty for taking the smack for relapsing. Nebdil gave me a harder time for relapsing than me. I don't know. Me being expressive in the way I am. It takes my mind off of having a habit. It takes my mind off of where I come from. It takes my mind off of my past. It takes my mind off of everything that's bad in my life because when you're me, you want to just do everything. You want to taste everything. I want to go everywhere. I want, but you don't understand how you can. Eat. It's like, well, well, how can I not go to Spain? How can I not go to Berlin? How can I not do all that stuff? And then you go to understand why you can. Eat. And it's like ambition and achievements in me, but I just don't know where it's gone. Do you know what I mean? I mean, you're on the drugs. That ambition and achievement is definitely suppressed. So you don't feel half as bad about being a failure. Forgive me, Lord, for every bag I sold. And forgive me for this poetry being so bold. It's just that this is what poverty holds. This is a street that me and my sister used to play when we were younger. They were the happiest days of our life before I got taken into care. Now it feels like the silence is deafening. Fuck, it deals for dramatic effect, like... <sighs> this is the road that we all used to fight and play at. That's where I got the scar on my head. I still don't know that I believe half the stories that have been told now. This was me, Gary, at four years old. My dad climbing up that drain pipe when he was drunk trying to kidnap me. I don't know why my mum moved a bit so much. I don't know why I went for political post. I was just about killed when my mum moved across to this side. See, the outside does this doesn't mean much. But this is Pelton, and where I come from is Muir House. I used to have to get chased along these streets when I had to get to my mum's house, and she stayed with her boyfriend. Just as soon as I get close to that flat though, the smells, the shouting, the feelings come back as if it was just happened yesterday. I can still hear my wee sister greeting as the belt hits her. I wasn't really that bored with the pain of the belt. Even at a young age I just couldn't understand why my mum let her boyfriend hit me. I'm not just talking about a hit. I'm talking about whipping with a rubber diving belt. It was a fucking ex-soldier. Now everything's different. I never ever thought I'd be back here like this. I've proved my mum wrong. I've proved them all wrong. I'm not going to spend my whole life in the jail. 
but I need to go back to my mum and my dad. Just to ask him why. Why did all this fucking happen? How did everything in my whole life become so fucked up? and I could just go straight into conflict with my old man. I could just say to him, why did you hit me? Like I was a fucking man when I was just a child. Why did you do it? But that's pointless, that's not intelligence. That's just telling you what happened. I actually want to show you, and to show you what happened, I can't have that aggression and conflict there. It needs to be an observational point of view. When you're the person on the other end of that, well, it's very hard to have an observational point of view. But let's see how good a fellow maker I am by having an impartial observational point of view. Don't know why I'm so scared. Nervous. Don't know why I'm so nervous. I just wish you could turn the coat back. <laughs> but whether whether you would do the same again, if you turn the coat back, it'd be a different scene. You, you didn't again if you did the same carry on or, or not. And Is there always a lot of fighting between you and my I can't really remember it. I can just remember a couple of the arguments. I think it was just me arguing all the time. Just through money as usual. Money, money, money. That's it. See, temper. Do you think temper has been a problem for you? Oh. I've not, got, I've not got a bad temper now, no compared to what it used to be like years ago. You think your old age should have just mellowed you a bit <laughs> wiser? Aye. I think I've inherited your temper. <laughs> I've got it, like, I just can't control it sometimes. It's uh, like, well, I'm, I'm the same, but I'm not no bad now, no compared to what it used to be years ago. When I first started running away and stuff like that, how did that make you feel, like, when I first started running away? I got just didn't care if I was coming or going. When you run away, you just write the phone box and you phone the post and post come and go to you and brought you in. Aye, can you remember the time that Marco shot him and everybody was in the house? Aye. I think that was like the last time that I was here before they took me away to foster care or something like that. Can you remember that time? Um, because when the post brought you back in, mate, I was going, I was going to hit you in the post and you are humble, who do you or so? <laughs> I remember. Aye. Just temper wise. He had a healthy reputation for a fighter and that in the pubs and that as well. Oh, aye. Can you, I yeah. bet you can't remember half your fight, you know? Uh, well, half the times it was getting through stupidness, but I would, I would, I would bang them first before I would, before they ask questions. I'd hit them and then I'd ask questions after it. <laughs> no, now I'd rather have a pint of beer and walk away. Aye. I can see for. How did Grandad discipline you? Just used to bars. <laughs> but like his hand or was it like a Some, skilled or Sometimes you've got sometimes we've got sometimes we've got the belt, it depends how, how bad how bad you'd be. Like I remember like sk we scalp and marble and stuff like that, uh, like under the belt. Uh, See the gent you just done exactly the way obviously less, because it wasn't as good as what well, uh, obviously you go for uh, granted. Uh, but do you think it's like a generation thing? So you went for uh, your dad uh, and then you disciplined like that. Uh, that's it.
Um, so how does it feel? How did it feel when I first came back into your life now? It's good. It was good just to get back into a relationship again. Because it's like you think you were never going to get contact again. It made, made me feel a lot better, you know? Kind of, wasn't it? No, telling any lies, I was quite happy when I got to Kenya again. I've not seen anything for that fucking long. Once we go back together, it was fucking brilliant. I don't ever think we'll have a relationship again. No, yeah, well, that was the same, same thing we made, I know, eh? But we got back together and that was the main. I think it took me to become a man to realise what a man was yeah, and his frustrations well, and what... Well, you realise what, what hassle you caused, you know, eh? Amazing, mate. Right, name Cheers. Thank you. Right, no problem. Sure. Speak to you something. I do want to be wrong in my life and completely leave my past behind me. Maybe this journey is going to help me. I need to knock on the doors of uncles and cousins that I've not seen for a wee while just to see where Ella stays. I'm going to go and try and find your sister, Ella. She's a good person, isn't she? I do can, as ever she is. I like trust with the, the chippy. How's it going? Where can we go? Uh, fancy, uh, you got a pint? Uh, pardon? Pint. Aye. Brilliant. We'll just aye. I can speak about what was like for... I was growing, growing up, up in that scene. Aye. Aye, neighbour is cuz. Brilliant. Good to see you again, my man. Cheers, mate. Go in here. Fucking man, I get flags, man. I'm fucking... I've got two ten of me, man. It's not that I first fucking ten flags. There's Uncle Benny. <laughs> There's my uncle. All right, Benji. Hey, but who's in? Uncle Jacob, that? Nah. Any of them? Oh, no bad. No bad, eh? Any. Oh. Do you know where my mum's staying these days? Nah. Uh, no. Do you know where I play? Nah. Where she do you know 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 Got a story behind it, come what I mean? And uh, like your story, oh, the back your story, story that your, takes it. Aye, but your, mate, your story is a fucking story. Come what I mean? Your story is a story of uh, a young boy who went downhill, really downhill, who basically, in my eyes, was never getting back up that hill. <laughs> and you've done his fucking proud, mate. <laughs> Absolute proud, mate. Cheers. So what do you think is the best way for me to approach Ella then? Cos, give me some advice, what do you think I should say? Eh, uh, <laughs> aye. You've been brought up in a good way, with like a loving family, like a good loving mum and a good aye. loving dad. Aye. And I, I've been brought up Blessed. with... We a good, I think a good dad, but I think a mum who doesn't can how to be a mum really. If that's a right way to say I, I, it, if you know what I mean. I think, if, I, I think if you put her on the spot and says to her, "Do you think you could have done better?" I think she would say, "I." I'll try. I'll try. Up until I had my own son, I wish Ella had an abortion. I've never felt loved by my mum. I always felt like the big mistake. I think Ella hates me. Just, just calm, man, because it's only a fucking mum. It's a fuck out of the day he didn't give a fuck. He just. He just won't be. Oh, fuck's sake, man. Number 12, that's my 
Vamos a hacer nada. Yeah. Yeah, mate, how you doing? You've lost some, mate, have you not? Oh, I'll tell you, mate. I'm not being good. I've done this all. Two more weeks to do this. Two more weeks to do this all. That gate door goes all the way around. All the way around. Big Merck and all that. Eh? The big Merck. The big Merck just gone past. Catch you later. Take care. Take care. She really couldn't really give a fuck if she sees me again or not. In her words, I've made my bed, so I'll lie in it, basically. There was no love. There was no... I don't know what to say, mate. And this is just like hopping back into being a bear and again, like... My mum says that, that, that I never felt the hell over Frey Bento's pie, that my dad was a prick, that she was the one that was out working her arse off on two jobs, um, three nights a week, somebody else looked after us, somebody capable looked after us. And the reason that I got put into care was because I just was a wee bastard and I couldn't handle any more. They couldn't handle me any more. So if I'm getting this right, my mum couldn't handle me any more because I was a wee bastard. My dad couldn't handle me anymore because of the wee bastard. Right, I'm thinking myself, right, aye, no problem, no problem. They're talking about a lady that's younger than Gary J. They're talking about somebody that's younger than what my wee lady is now. Without a doubt, education saved my life. I've come back to the college where I first learned how to use a camera to speak to my ex-lecturer and see what it was like for him actually having a student like me. <laughs> how you doing? How you keeping? The chance that you gave me definitely saved my life, or the, the opportunity that was, got, that was presented. And I remember going up to the old college. I think, I, I think it, was, it was you that sort of did it, really, because, I mean... My in instinct was, you know, this guy's like obviously on something and, you know, there's no way just looking at you that, that he's going to like be able to succeed in the media because you know what p media people are like. And uh, so I'm like making a, an instant judgment there. But then you were so determined, you know, and you kept coming around and pushing me and pushing me. I thought, what the hell, you know, give it a shot. You know, if he, if he, I said, if you finish your NC, you know, I'll let you on the course. 
but you were the first person to show me what I look like on drugs. We'd done a mock interview, and the mock interview we'd done, I was, I was on my normal prescription. And we showed it back upstairs. You never showed it to anybody else. You just put it on. And I remember how stunned I actually looked. And I thought that I put myself across in such uh -huh. a presentable way. I came in with a suit and that on, I think. I came in with a suit and that on. And I gave the mock interview. When I looked at it back, that was the first ever time that I'd seen this is what people see with Gary then. And for me, that was time to come off. Uh -huh. That was one of the moments where it was like, no, nah, this is time to start really looking at getting clean now and coming off. The, the notable, noticeable changes were obviously uh, coming off the drugs or the... I mean, I remember you trying to come off the methadone once or twice and that was, that was a struggle. So seeing, seeing that and you were consciously aware that that was a problem for you and you were, you know, working, working through it. Um, you also used to mention Gary J a lot. You know, you used to say Gary J was the turning point in your life. You know, and, so, and so as a family guy, you know, I mean, I think that was driving you as well. I mean, and you were driven. For the writing now, I really do feel like there's a moral responsibility that I've got that mm -hmm. the previous experience that I've got is all dripped in blood. Yeah, that's one of the things uh, that always, that sort of blew me away when uh, you'd written the, well, I can't remember which draft it was. You, you, you did do the drafts, you did several drafts of scripts of uh, uh, Tolerance. Uh, it wasn't called that then. What green. Was it called? Green, aye. Um, and I said, yeah, it's all right, it's good, but the, there's something wrong with the end. You know, the end is not really working. I mean, what you need is a, you know, an, an end that makes people go, wow, you know, I've never seen that before. And, and I sort of said, away you go, I thought. <laughs> and so you went away and you came back and I thought, bloody hell, that's amazing. You know, where did that come from? You know, that thing about the ambulance guy standing outside the door and being scared to come in or not being allowed to come in. You know, I thought, that, you know, that never even occurred to me that that might happen. And yeah, it, it happens, obviously. Any film and director that you would love to be like, they look for the realness in people. The way I see myself right now, or the way I see myself, I've done my work too. Mark them, boys. Come on, man. Yeah, <laughs> 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 People like me wear their hat on their sleeves. Outspoken. Not afraid to speak about social issues that other people shy away from. Sometimes in life you've just got to melt your colours to the mass and that's what I've done when it's come to the film making. I've decided not to be a criminal, not to be a drug dealer. Help parents and nail my colours to the mask that this is what makes sense to me, being creative and experiencing different colours and how to use everything to your advantage. This is the fourth, fourth time I've tried to get my results, so I'm just going to go into the doctors and fuck it. We'll see ya. Negative. 
the result was negative. It's just some chance to play here. This is the area that taught me everything that I needed to know to survive on the streets. This is where all my family were. All my life I ran away in search of a family that wanted to love me, but now I've got one of my own. I'm a proud father with two daughters and a son. It's funny coming down here. This is the last of a place that I was innocent. This is the place where I jumped about with my first ever crew or whatever. The, not even a crew, just fucking stupid bearings. And I think there's two of us left alive out of the five of us that were down here that day, probably. Maybe this whole fucking world just doesn't make sense to me and that's just the way it's supposed to be. I don't know what answers I was expecting. Maybe I was looking and hoping to get a new sense of identity. Maybe that's the silver lining on the end of this story. There's always hope. Making these films isn't a choice for me. It's the only thing I know what to do. And it's the only thing that keeps me in trouble. It makes my kids proud. It makes my family proud. And I've beaten all the odds. And I can take some pride in the fact I am who I am. And I'll continue my life and keep making films in my very own Gary Fraser way. Product decent raw, living heading for a Scottish prison. Fuck your flawed system, I've risen above the law. Listen, I've been to hell and back, smoking crack, selling smack. Try to get my story straight so I can tell it back. Became a man at eight, every night my ma was late Making sure my sister had a warm plate But what thanks did I get, treated like I'm a regret Exiled from my family and friends And so I'd go nuts The youngest Scott they'd ever locked up So fuck, did they understand the way I've grown up I've been through physical and sexual abuse Living with prostitutes, peddling themselves for a boost My city's rife with AIDS, people taking lives with blades Colder than the escapades and so we smoking nights away The drug and thug culture, I'm stuck with bloodthirsty vultures And I wonder what I've done to get my lung punctured Started off with DFs and made my way to green meth With each breath I regret the price of being a scheme vet Back in my homeland, I'll take shit for the bam You think you're a brave man, step up and get your face tanned I'm the messiah to these cunts that are jagging Helping them day with cash out in the hunt for the dragon Plus I'm dealing with my own habit How'd you tell your way? Daddy's an addict That's why his face is crabbit Bloody nails, dusty scales Already out in fucking bail I'm getting cuffed in jail I need to chill Take a second think, re-evaluate I want to create, no be resigned to my father's fate Makes my mates are deceased I feel ashamed of my deeds You grow up hard when you're raised on the streets Jump blow and a knife Two lassies, one boy and a wife The story of my life